So there is a new study that shows that masculinity itself is harmful. And no, you're not hearing me incorrectly, and I didn't forget a qualifier there. Not toxic masculinity, not masculinity gone awry. And they're saying that masculinity itself, traditional masculinity, is in and of itself harmful. And this study was drafted and worked on by Ryan McDermott, who was sort of the head guy on this, who is a psychologist at the University of South Alabama. And he helped draft these guidelines that were put out by the American Psychological Association. And just to give you an idea of some of the things contained within this report, here's just a, uh, we're going to read a few excerpts from this particular guideline. So the American Psychological Association writes, the main thrust of the subsequent research is that traditional masculinity marked by stoicism, competitiveness, dominance, and aggression is on the whole harmful. Okay, well, there's a couple of things here. First of all, all of those things can be done correctly. And when they are done correctly, they're actually very beneficial. Let's go through them. Stoicism. What they're talking about when it comes to stoicism is not giving into your emotions and impulses at every single turn. That's what stoicism really is, is that you don't necessarily follow your first instinct, your first impulse. You think through a problem and without jumping to your emotions at the first sign of an emotion being there, you actually try to solve the problem without going to your emotions. It's actually a call to logical thinking. Now, granted, there is a extreme that you can go to to where that's not good, to where, in other words, you ignore emotion altogether and try not to have any emotion. You have no um, sympathy for other people, that kind of thing. And so, yes, that can go awry. But as far as stoicism itself, stoicism is actually a good thing in the fact that men are not as emotional as women and that we do tend to think clearly, more clearly in pressure situations. Again, I'm using generalizations here. This doesn't mean that every man is, is like this and every woman is not like this. I'm using generalities here. But stoicism is actually something that can be a really good thing, especially in high-pressure situations or when it comes to decision-making. Competitiveness. Everything that you're seeing around you right now, I would guess, especially if you're watching this internet broadcast, is the result of competitiveness. In fact, I am competing against other broadcasters right now, and I'm trying really hard to make this a good show because I know that there are other people also trying to do good shows out there. I imagine if you're at work right now watching this, that you are competing against other businesses if you happen to work in the private sector to try to get business away from them. Competitiveness is a good thing. It advances it, it advances uh, society as a whole. It advances you personally. You have to improve and get better in order to succeed. Some of the competitions that I was in in high school, for example, debate, speech, those things, being competitive, wanting to win, trying to better myself so that I could win and beat out those that were also trying really hard to beat me is what gave me the skills and the knowledge and the ability to do what I'm doing today and to make a career out of it. So yes, competitiveness is a really good thing. This is not something that is harmful to humanity as a whole. In fact, competitiveness and wanting to be better is what has led to the Industrial Revolution. Our way of life is built on the idea of competitiveness. All right, so dominance and aggression. Dominance is good in a sense. And when I'm talking about I'm not talking about oppression. I'm talking about having a dominant type A kind of personality that allows you to lead people, that gives you the ability to drive people into a particular direction. I'm not talking about doing anything nefarious or abusing people. I'm talking about using your influence in a way to bring positivity to others, which is what a leader does. He influences other people and he motivates them to move in a certain direction. Sometimes for his benefit, sometimes for the benefit of the group. But nonetheless, dominance can actually be a good thing. We have to have a, a structure in order to order society, to order businesses, and to order even the family. In the household, there is a reason that there is a hierarchy that is involved there. And so dominance, submissiveness can be a good thing, and everybody has to do both at some point in their life. Everybody's got to be a leader at some point. Everybody's got to be a follower at some point. And it is a, the very wise man that understands that sometimes it's best to lead, sometimes it's best to follow, and to understand when those situations are. And then aggression. 
Look, aggression is a very good thing when channeled correctly. You guys know I'm a martial artist. Studied Taekwondo for about four or five years. And one of the very first things that they teach you is to how to channel your aggression. The reason that your first day is usually teaching you blocks and defensive moves and you don't really get into offense until a little bit later is because they're wanting to teach you to control your body and to control your emotions and control your aggression. Because aggression, when used correctly, can be used to defend yourself, can be used to defend others, can motivate a man to take up a cause that can benefit others or society as a whole. It also can lead to righteous indignation, which leads men to correct injustices and immoralities. And so aggression can be a very good thing when used correctly. Obviously, when aggression is used incorrectly and it hurts other people, then that's bad. But you're saying here that aggression in and of itself is bad. And that goes to their larger point saying that traditional masculinity is, again, their words, not mine, on the whole, harmful. No, they're not. You can come up with scenarios with any of these traits that you've just listed to explain how they can be used correctly and can be used to people's benefit. So we go a little bit further in this report. The more men conformed to masculine norms, the more likely they were to consider as normal risky behavior uh, uh, risky behaviors such as healthy, heavy drinking, using tobacco, avoiding vegetables, and to engage in these risky behaviors themselves. Okay, here's the thing. First of all, it's never good to abuse your body. Never. In fact, the scripture teaches us that our body is a temple. It's a gift from God. Just like any of our other blessings, we are to be stewards of this blessing, and that means that we are to use it correctly and in a way that is fitting with our Father's design. So when we're talking about health risk, tobacco use, heavy drinking, that kind of thing, that's bad. And we understand that. But again, that's not something that is limited to masculinity. There are plenty of women that have issues with these same vices. And so there, there's not anything that is inherently masculine about them. Now, avoiding the vegetables thing, again, things need to be done in balance. But the reason that the male body craves meat more than the female body is because we use our body for different things. Women tend to need more energy and they need to, you know, for childbearing or whatever else, their bodies are designed in such a way that they can intake vegetables and they, their body craves vegetables and other plant-based foods more than we do. It's just the way their brain is wired. It's the way their biology works. Men, on the other hand, tend to crave meat, not because society has taught us to, but because our bodies need more fat and protein, because we're supposed to be hunter-gatherers and defenders. And when you're doing that, you need more muscle mass, and you need more alertness and everything else, and because of that, that's why our bodies crave more meat. Now, it's not good to eat only meat or only vegetables, and that's the same could be said for women as well. But my point in all of this is they act as though just because the male body needs more protein and thus craves more meat, that this is somehow attributed to people that only eat meat, never eat any vegetables, and live a very unhealthy lifestyle. That is not the case. Furthermore, let's not pretend that poor health decisions are specifically a male problem. There's plenty of women that smoke, drink, engage in all kinds of other unhealthy activities. And so... Let's not pretend that it's only a, a male problem. And another thing, too, there is this unfortunate hesitancy to talk about men in the positive sense, and this is sort of an outcropping of that. One of the things that it mentions in there is for them to engage in risky behavior. Well, risk that is unnecessary is certainly bad. If you're taking risk just for the sake of taking risk, if you're a thrill seeker, then that's not necessarily healthy. But risky behavior can be a very good thing. For example, there are guys out there that quit college and started a business in their parents' garage and built one of the greatest tech companies, one of the most wealthy companies in the world right now. One of those guys' names was Bill Gates. He took a very risky move in just not going to college, not relying on anybody else, just had an idea, thought that he would start it on his own, and he did. And now he's one of the wealthiest men on earth. 
and other people's lives have been enriched because the Windows operating system has helped so many people. And you could go down the list. There's no telling how many entrepreneurs I could give J.C. Penney. Uh, you could go with uh, John D. Rockefeller. I mean, there's, uh, Henry Ford. You can go through the list of all these innovators. How did they become innovators? Because they took risk and did things that were not necessarily sure things. Risky behavior leads men to make a better society. Risky behavior leads us to explore the unknown. It encourages us to defend the innocent, to stick our necks out for other people. And so the idea that risky behavior in and of itself is bad is patently false. And you would think that the American Psychological Association would know that, but apparently they do not. So here's another little excerpt from it. Transgender issues are at the forefront of the cultural conversation, and there is an increased awareness of diversity of gender identity. It's no longer just the male-female binary. Okay, so here we actually get to the point of all this. We get to the underlying thing that they're really trying to get to, which is they don't like masculinity, they don't like men. That's really what all this boils down to is that they don't like men, and they don't like men that act like men, and because of that, they're saying that masculinity on the whole is harmful. And the reason that they're saying that, the reason this is taking place, is because they want to break down this idea that men and women are different. Which is ironic, because they just spent an entire article telling us how men engage in behavior that is not attributed to women, or at least not in their mind, and saying that, Okay, well, these are all the ways that men are toxic and men are bad and masculinity is bad. By the way, masculinity is not a thing. Well, <laughs> why did you spend the whole freaking article talking to us about masculinity if you don't believe that men and women are a thing? This is the thing that is so funny when talking to people that are transgender activists is that inevitably, if they try to – Rational, uh, rationalize their ideas if they try to explain their ideas to you, they're going to run into conflicts themselves. That's why it's so easy to debate one of them. Because to be honest, you don't have to do that much work to make them look foolish. You just kind of sit there and let them talk. And eventually they're going to run into contradictions. They're going to run it because they're not operating from a place of logic. And so this guy who wrote this article from the University of South Alabama basically spends an entire article explaining to us that men are bad and masculinity is bad and traditional masculinity is bad and all this other stuff and keeps going on and on and on about it. And then he gets pretty close to the end of it. And he's like, oh, and by the way, there, it's not just male and female. There's all kinds of different stuff. And, and you know, men and women, that's just a social construct. Well, <laughs> if men are just a social construct, then masculinity doesn't exist. If that's the case, then what you're talking about is just bad behavior. That's not masculinity. If masculinity and femininity are just things that we made up and they're not real, well, then you're arguing against something that doesn't exist. And it's a really, really strange way to end this whole thing. And, of course, you know how this ended because they couldn't do this article without hitting the entire spectrum of intersectionality. So they say this at the end. Boys and men in color are dealing with the hurts and struggles in ways that are consistent with masculinity. Yeah. You know why? Do you know why boys of color, as they call it, I would just say people that aren't white. Do you know why they're struggling with that? Because they have a higher rate of absent fathers. And I know that that's an uncomfortable subject to talk about, but if you're looking at statistically, it's just the truth. That even though it's a growing problem in the white, you know, for white people as well, if you're looking at, quote-unquote, boys of color, if you're looking at minorities, the reason that they're struggling more with masculinity is because they don't have male role models in the house. I had a good friend, and I think I can, I can talk about this now because it's several years ago, and she doesn't even work at the school anymore, um, wound up moving somewhere else because her husband got a job in a different part of the country. But I had a good friend that was a teacher, and she taught first graders in the Montgomery school system and had about, I think she said about 18 or 20 kids. And she said that out of all of those kids, not a single man in their family had a job because she was doing a lecture and, and talking about jobs to these first graders. And she had to explain what a job was, first of all, 
And every one of the kids that she asked, because she went around the room, and she wasn't doing this to prove some political point or anything. This was just part of her lesson. She said that not a single one of them had a male in the house that worked. There were some that had men in the house, but everyone that had a job was either a mom, an aunt, a grandma. None of them had men in the house that actually worked, which means that they did not have men in the house. They had boys in the house if they had any male people in the house with them. They did not have a man that teach that would teach them to be responsible, to care for their family, to provide for others. And that really is tragic. And this was a largely minority group of kids, as you can imagine. And so it really is sad that what is being prescribed here is that masculinity itself is toxic. And then it's talking about the problems that are hit hardest with, quote unquote, boys of color. And they don't even realize that the problem is a lack of masculinity, not an abundance of it. If we had fathers in the homes teaching children the way that they are supposed to act, because here's the thing, no boy can become a man without a man showing him how to become a man. Now, that can come in different forms. doesn't necessarily have to be a dad. It can be a very responsible older brother. It can be a minister. It can be a teacher. It can be a, a coach of some kind. There are a lot of different ways that that can go, but the point is boys cannot become men unless a man shows them how to be a man. And because of that, there are a lot of the boys that without the father who's supposed to be the primary role model in their life, and I understand that you know sometimes circumstances happen and men can't be present you know, I, I, in my family. We had a guy that, that died when his son was very young, and because of that, he was mostly raised by his mother and his grandparents. And that's fine, because he had a strong male role model in the house to show him the way to be a man. But the point in all of that is, if you're looking at all these homes that are devoid of male influence, and then you're noticing that there is a problem with masculinity, what you're actually saying is that there is a lack of masculinity, not an excess of it. In fact, if this traditional masculinity that this report is saying is on the whole harmful, according to them, actually, if you're looking at the data that they admit in their own paper here, that one of the problems is that there are minority boys that do not that are that are struggling with these issues. Yeah, because a lot of them, a higher percentage of them than their white counterparts don't have male role models in their life to show them how to be masculine. And so the irony in this whole thing is that they're actually, this problem would be largely fixed if there was more masculinity, not less. Because being male is not inherently evil, even though this is sort of the idea that this paper is trying to drum up. We actually need more men that are responsible, loving, care about their wives and their families. That would be something that largely resolves this problem. Getting rid of masculinity or treating men and women as though they are interchangeable, that's not doing anything to fix it. We've tried that for a really long time. Guess what? It doesn't work. It just doesn't work. And the facts and the statistics bear that out. This is normally the part of the video where I tell you to go ahead and like and subscribe. But the truth is, I really don't care whether you do or not. I mean, it's not like you really need all the latest news and commentary from me. It's not like there's a lot of really important stuff going on in the world and in the state of Alabama right now that you should probably be aware of. So, you know what? Like and subscribe. Or don't. I don't really care. Reverse psychology. Boom.